welcome to talk tiger today with uh, marine biologist samyukta uh, she has an expertise in understanding how nature works and she has been studying uh, for the last 6 or 7 years about what is happening whenever disaster strikes or how nature is responding to emergencies so today i have requested her to join us uh, to tell us what she learned from corona and the effect of covid 19 welcome samyukta uh hello yeah. uh vamshian so, so can you explain um, about, uh, your background and then we'll go into discussion all right all right so um, my name is samyukta and as per training i am a wildlife biologist and uh, i am heading into uh, marine biology as a specialization as i've been interested in that for quite some time and uh, through the last couple of years i have been working with um, social uh, science uh, and how that can be included in uh, wildlife and marine conservation per se i am currently working with uh, wwf india and uh, i am working with a marine team on uh, um, how turtle conservation can happen uh, while coexisting with uh, with the fishing industry mm-hmm. and i'm very excited to be here and quite nervous good boy so can you tell us uh, what did you why do why do you think uh, think something like corona came uh, so though it we, we all know some market in china but what do you think is it sudden or was it expected um to be frank i was expecting it because this is something that i've studied about and it's not just me uh, but people in my community as uh, students of wildlife science mm. uh, we long expected uh, diseases to shift from uh, animals to human beings and uh, these kind of diseases are actually classified as zoonotic diseases because they come from animals that is zoo i mean not zoo per se but so that's a greek word that that means mm. Uh, animals and uh, um, not just the fact that we are coming in such close contact with animals but mm. also the fact that current anthropogenic pressures and the entire environment environment that has been altered by human beings um, that is the back backdrop mm. on which coronavirus the novel novel coronavirus has actually jumped into the stage mm. on world stage and uh, it has literally brought human kind to its knees in such a um, i mean i don't mean to sound like uh, uh, somebody who is very cynical or pessimistic but for somebody who studies these things mm. this is very beautiful this is something straight out of a textbook and into your daily life this has impacted the world over in every way the way you consume things the way you live the way you go the way you travel basically what you eat everything has been impacted just by this tiny tiny virus um and you know viruses are not like bacteria uh, so so this virus just bringing us uh, to our knees is is very uh, it's it's almost it's almost like a song it's it's a very beautiful song uh, but i understand that it comes at its own cost mm-hmm. i mean mankind as being you know at the top of the food chain being very intelligent and all that but uh, yeah i mean it has literally brought us to our knees and it has come at a very very high cost so only humans are affected nature is not affected so how is nature responding to something like this so um so pandemics are epidemics that happen all over in different uh, uh, sizes and scales uh, when it comes to nature these kind of uh, epidemics as well as pandemics have broken out in the past and several times in the past in fact it has helped change and shape human evolution that, to the way that it is today uh, homo sapiens uh, have been formed because of a lot of these push and pull factors of which epidemics and pandemics form a major chunk of them having resistance to the kind of uh, microbes that cause these diseases uh, is selecting couple of them 
and making everybody else go away die perish go extinct whatever you want to call it the ones that are selected are the ones that reproduce and create more of their kind so it's it's a very uh, i mean i am i am uh, <laughs> i am not a whistleblower but this is very beautiful as a human being to look at all of this happen all around me to read about it it's quite beautiful so that is the impact on human beings as we are seeing the numbers go up every single day every hour for that matter all across the world not just in india and uh, keeping humans aside which i always do as a wildlife biologist uh, hmm. coming to the animal uh, kingdom coming to wildlife um, i think that the again going back to the reason why coronavirus has happened um, i know a lot of people are like bats and things like that uh you know bats have to be killed for coronavirus or any other new viruses to not come into human systems mm. but i mean there are all kinds of rumors that are doing the rounds uh, on on all kinds of social media platforms but mm. one thing i very uh, um i just want to sort of explain to everybody that bats are not the reason that there is coronavirus mm. coronavirus is a natural uh uh it's it's a very normal sort of a system of having microbes having pathogens having parasites i mean a lot of us have actually been uh, impacted by parasites in our childhood by having you know ringworm infections and things like that when we were little mm. and as technology has advanced ha- as uh, there have been advancements in the medical industry all of these things sort of have been controlled which have resulted in another factor major factor that has come to light that is the human population and with that we are automatically putting a lot of pressure on the animal kingdom itself and uh, putting a lot of pressure because of the resources that that we are tipping everything in that favor in the favor of feeding them as we consider ourselves to be the engineers of the world we are basically changing ecosystems we are deciding when a forest should be cut down that forest is older than you it's older than uh, it's older than me obviously it's older than the human race mm-hmm. i mean, it's crazy what gives us the right to go ahead and make these changes mm-hmm. putting all of these things in perspective i want to say that all of this high population basically puts us at loggerheads we wouldn't have interacted with human with uh, animals or wildlife if there weren't this high number of people mm. isn't why we go out venture out of our settlements and ex like sort of expand or try to push our uh, uh, interface of interaction is because we want more resources where are these resources in the nat- natural world and in the natural world when you go out seeking say bauxite or when you go out looking for uranium or when you want timber hmm. you also get other things right it's like one of those amazing diwali bonanzas where you get uh, electronics and uh, you also get like books free or something like that mm. so you can't just get the timber out of the forest without having repercussions mm. so um, this is uh, i mean there's a very beautiful uh, um, phenomenon it so i am into philosophy a lot um, and uh, i so there is this thing called the butterfly effect where mm. you have um, a small well let me explain butterfly effect to the one who don't know a small flutter of a butterfly's wing mm. in okay so you are explaining the um, so a small i'm sorry you are talking about the butterfly effect the small flutter of yes. this wing can cause a tsunami on the other side yes this tiny action will uh, there is a huge yes. later on i mean it's also uh, it's it's kind of funny because uh, i i mean I'm, it this is a beautiful segue in fact uh, you uh, brought up the issue of uh, not issue more like the situation of the tsunami so mm. during my master 
program i was working in um, uh, in the remote islands of nicobar mm -hmm. um, in the central nicobar group of islands um, for my master's thesis which was obviously in marine biology mm -hmm. and um, i was uh, studying the impact of uh, i was basically studying influence of various characters on the benthic invertebrates so mm -hmm. Uh, temperature salinity on the tiny um, i don't know how to describe but they are the animals that are present on the beach between the tides between the tidal area so i was looking at that and uh, the most important aspect of my uh, study um, or rather my biggest learning from that entire stint was the fact that i was getting to work in a place where firstly you will not get access through uh, uh you know tourism or just civilians are not allowed there mm -hmm. and i am very grateful to the forest department and uh, uh you know uh, everybody else that sort of made it possible through the ministry and my own institution made it possible mm -hmm. so i was working in an area it it was part of a tribal reserve where you had uh, where you had the tribal people over there i know you are all thinking that i must probably be working in the area where people would probably be wearing uh, minimal clothing and would still be using bows and arrows that was not the case mm -hmm. uh, in their land an island a tiny 5 square kilometer island in the middle of nowhere surrounded by the high seas on every side mm -hmm. tiny island that by one wave of the tsunami the wave that came during the during the tsunami completely covered the island and there were very few people that survived and they survived by clinging on to the tall coconut trees to uh, you know basically seeking shelter somewhere and a lot of people were actually sort of um, taken away by the wave they have seen a lot of hardships that we cannot even begin to imagine forget understanding mm. those are the people that i lived with and they have shown me what humanity actually and genuinely is they have very little resources they do not have a source of power because all of their solar panels and things like that that the government provided them before the tsunami were taken in the tsunami and the government would have to invest all of that money back again to bring power to them there the power runs on diesel the mobile towers are run on diesel if the diesel from the mainland does not come there it's a huge issue for them and uh, that's how they have been living there and uh, all i want to say is they are a very resilient uh, um they are a very resilient bunch of people they are very um, in touch with their humanity and the impacts that they have on their environment and at the same time they are a wonderful representation of what we are and as well as at the same time what we should be and can be so what is your suggestion for people uh... audible um yes to... so somebody said uh, you, you have seen nature uh, reclaim some of the spaces there are dolphins in thames uh, there are uh, leopards out in the street birds are coming back turtles have come back to orissa nature is slowly reclaiming and it looks like it is celebrating when uh, people actually take a step back so as we are opening up lockdown and people are going back to civilian life again what is your what are the takeaways that you want to tell us um so to begin with uh i would say that what has happened now um is something that will be written in the history books this is these are unprecedented times these are very difficult times and these are uh, situations that none of us have experienced before and uh, there is no rule book of any kind but the fact that the entire country has gone uh, into a lockdown mm. the entire world has gone into a lockdown dealing with things at their local levels mm. it's uh, uh it's it's i i am not i'm i'm at a loss for words about how 
um, uh, you know, governance has sort of come into play in this situation. At the same time, uh, when humans are, so, you know, sort of have retraced their steps, have retreated, so to say, mm. you have, uh, you know, the natural world sort of um, uh, taking what is rightfully theirs, if I can say so. Um, mm. And the fact that we aren't going out is making our house, our zoo. And that's exactly what all these animals have been feeling for so long. I do understand and I have worked in a lot of uh, uh, these protected areas, which are uh, tiger reserves, nat national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. But the boundary that has been established for them that the birds are going to fly you know leopards can jump over a fence uh, you know uh, insects are going to fly out of there you know there will be termites there'll be ants there's the wind there's the water you cannot stop rivers these boundaries set by humans hmm. are rigid in our heads but that's not the case with the animals or with the plants or with anything for that matter and the fact that uh, animals are currently now coming back into spaces and reclaiming them uh, should be an indication of, of what they need. We have been pushing them back. We have been almost suffocating them for quite some time now. We have been putting pressures through mining, through deforestation, through all kinds of things. We've been, I mean, speaking about, uh, uh, you know, I haven't spoken about the marine or the coastal system for, for all this while now. But, uh, you know, dredging for uh, sand or creating navigation channels uh, for easy access for transport for uh, uh, trade in ports and things like that does impact the beaches and the animals and the organisms that are dependent on them. The fact that the entire world has come to a lockdown where human activities of all kinds have been put under such a restriction is such a is is like I said, it's it's unprecedented, and that has basically resulted in giving these animals and these wildlife breathing space. And breathing space means that you know they are only taking what they need, not what they want. Greed is another thing. Like I told you, I I am a huge philosopher. I feel I feel like so greed is something that is a huge fatal flaw in human beings. Mm. Um, so we have been pushing back. They have sort of been under a lot of pressure. We have been dictators for them. Mm. And uh, now they're sort of bouncing back. Now that you have uh, very little uh, industrialization, we have very little factories that are functional up the stream, uh, up, up rivers. So we have very, very low uh, pollution that has been coming down. The entire Ganges has been cleansed out. You know, uh, 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 to be frank, this is when you should probably celebrate the when you actually have uh, the replenishing of the uh, waters of the Ganges. I think this is the time where we should celebrate that because that is exactly what has happened with no human interference. And yeah, I mean, uh, that's not the only thing that has happened. You also have, uh, uh, like you rightly pointed out, you have turtles coming out of... Uh, uh, in large numbers, turtles have been, you know, uh, coming to lay eggs this time and uh, uh, there were no pressures. In fact, we were under uh, section 144 and uh, there was absolute ban on movement at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I very strongly believe that the lockdown has uh, helped understand what the impact of uh, uh, human beings is on these creatures. Uh, so that we can understand what our future looks like. If we know what our present looks like, that's when we can sort of make predictions or uh, look forward. In time. So once people go back to doing whatever they're doing, for example, mining, uh, going back to offices, going, cut, going back to cutting trees and all that. So do you think there will be some impact uh, from Corona that help nature, will that sustain or is it just temporary? So, um, to be frank, there is something that I'm very afraid of. Mm -hmm. And I've said that with you. 
because I believe that the more people are aware about things, um, the choice is on to them. Uh, the fact that a lockdown of uh, two and a half months roughly, uh, if you look at it, mm. um, has brought back all these animals that were very quiet, that have been, you know, suppressed and uh, have were facing a lot of these pressures. The fact that, you know, nature shows this resilience is what I believe is going to be an issue in the future because development is going to say that, you know, now that we've, we know that, you know, dolphins are going to come back, turtles are going to come and lay eggs if we stop work for one month. So how does it matter if I'm going to, you know, mine through the forests or uh, if I create a navigation channel or if I make a dam or, you know, if I do any of these developmental activities, mm. at the end of it, if I can just stop and if I can just pick up these pieces and just leave, go home, after a month, you're going to have everything back to normal. Dolphins are still going to be swimming. So that is something I'm genuinely afraid of. Mm. Because it's the impact on humans is not something that is, uh, uh, you know, that can be explained for that matter. We are, uh, you know, we have borrowed this earth. We have rented this earth from our children, from our future generations. We owe something to them, to mankind, to humankind, if not the world, since we're such selfish species. Mm. I'm, that, that's something I'm very much afraid of. Mm. I have probably not answered your question entirely. <laughs> so what, what do you think we should do? Take away. So somebody who, is, who, is, uh, who wants to contribute, what are the lifestyle changes that we should do to help nature? So, um, I think having the first uh, step in all of this is having an unbiased, open mind and a knack for absorbing information. If not a knack, at least you must be open to understanding what the situation is around you. Basically, you need to open your eyes move away from technology for a little bit and experience nature. That is, experience nature firsthand is the first step towards, uh, you know, uh, connect with it. How can you believe in a cause if you, uh, how can you contribute to a cause or anything for that matter? How can you take any action if you don't believe in it? If you do not have conviction, again, this is the philosopher in me speaking. Uh, but if you do not believe in something, it gets quite tricky to, uh, for you to continue this on a long term. And if that is something that people are interested in, conservation of, uh, you know, wildlife is something that people are interested in, want to invest in and things like that. We have to make a certain lifestyle changes, which I believe uh, have been in the world for quite some time, uh, in their own tiny ways. Um, to begin with, if I may say so, um, <laughs> capitalism and consumerism. Mm. These are the things that have basically resulted in uh, large shifts and uh, you know there's a disparity, there's a, a very high disparity of how wealth is, is distributed across uh, individuals in the entire world. Mm. And uh, you know with money, basically how has this money come to these uh, large conglomerates? They have come through the, through the products that they have designed. And why have the products been designed or made in such a way? Because of, of the demand that is there from the consumers. Mm. If at the very grassroots level, if we can make tiny changes, uh, I believe that, like I said, the butterfly effect, right? Tiny changes can actually cause a hurricane in every part of the world. Mm. So, um, Taking that forward, I think uh, the first thing is to look for sustainability in your lifestyle choices. I know sustainability has been such a key word. It has been one of those things that uh, uh, large companies and investors are looking for in every proposal. And uh, a lot of uh, assessments and things are also made on them. But let me say this. 
I love Nutella, but the fact that it contains palm oil and high and how palm oil is directly linked with destruction of rainforests in in Southeast Asia and how the, the destruction of those rainforests has has resulted in a decline in orangutans is something I'm genuinely concerned about. Mm -hmm. I can do without Nutella. I can find alternate choices. I can look for something greener. I can look for something that is, you know, it's not going to kill me if I don't eat Nutella. The same thing with fashion. Fashion is something that's, uh, you know, a very sensitive topic uh, because uh, a lot of economy rests on its shoulder and things like that. Fast fashion is the major issue right now. Uh, when you have seasons or, you know, when you have collections, those are the things that result in a lot of pressure that is put on the fashion industry, the textile industry. And, you know, subsequently there's a lot of water that is, that is going into all of these uh, activities to support this massive industry. Fast fashion is a huge threat to all of these uh, resources, to be frank. And uh, making choices, I mean, you can wear the same shirt several times. In fact, uh, uh, you know, large, uh, well, billionaires, let me put it this way. Let me make it more palatable to people. Billionaires, um, say Steve Jobs actually said that he has very few choices that he makes in fashion. He's always seen wearing that large, uh, wearing that black turtleneck and jeans. Because choosing fashion takes out time from your life. You know, I'm just making it palatable to people. <laughs> so making these choices takes out time from your life and also you have energy to make these choices. If there weren't choices, if you just had to eat, you know, dal chawal for the rest of your life, I, I'm not asking you to make that change, but at the same time, if you were to sort of cut down on things that you can just, so, like, you know, uh, sort of live on. You don't have to have a new party uh, dress every single weekend. It's just these tiny things that contribute because every drop adds to the ocean. If, you, if the demand from the consumers reduces, you have this thing sort of climbing up and up and up, building up a lot of momentum. And this is where the production sort of reduces or takes into a direction that is into alternate, sustainable and greener ways. I mean, Nutella is just one thing. Fast fashion is just one thing. There are a lot more uh, aspects to this uh, that can actually be explored uh, and have been explored in, in great detail in different parts of the world. You have zero waste that is something... Uh, uh, that's a new lifestyle change that a lot of people are looking into, you know, where they're sort of making sure that they're recycling, reusing and being just responsible in their day-to-day -day activities. So we'll close this episode at this note that Samyukta suggested. Uh, I think I've lost. Okay. So on this note, we'll end today's episode. Uh, like Samika suggested, a small break of two and a half months uh, showed signs of nature healing, but that doesn't mean that it is completely healed. Uh, we have caused a lot of destruction with our ways of choices and nature has been hurting from a long time and we are borrowing this from our children. So the simplest way that you can contribute is make sustainable choices pick up products, encourage organic and healthy and things that you can recycle and also spend some time connecting with nature whether it is, it is spending time gardening or spending time trying to be with nature. Your choices will impact how your children are going to see this, whether they will see the turtle in, a, in reality or whether they see it in a picture. So we'll connect again to Samyukta the next time with more information about uh, how this has impacted because it's still being understood. A lot of study has to be done to see how actually human stepping back has helped nature. We'll yes. keep discussing Samyukta again for the next episode, probably in a month's time. Any last Thanks words? Thanks so much. Um, there's this famous, um, or rather let me say my favorite quote uh, mm. ever, and I have uh, ended 
nearly all my presentations if not most mm. with this uh, statement uh, no blue no green you know uh, if you do not conserve mm. if you do not save the uh, oceans then you do not have anything because that's where life originated from so i want to say no blue no green <laughs> thank you and have a good day thank you so much <laughs>